Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and today I think you're going to enjoy our conversation with Tom Rayner. Tom is the founder and CEO of Church Answers, and with nearly 40 years of ministry experience, he spent a lifetime committed to the growth and health of the local church and its leaders, having pastored himself four churches, as well as serving as interim pastor to 10 churches. Tom's a popular speaker, professor, dean, and author, and his latest is I Am a Christian, Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus Together with Fellow Believers. But first, let's go to Ed Stetzer, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and executive director of the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Well, and it's good to have Tom Rainer on the program. Let me remind you, as always, to like and share wherever you download your podcast. Helps other people hear about the podcast. We have some really, I think, insightful and helpful conversations. We're going to have one today. And as always, let me encourage you to uh, to engage these things, share with others, share with other people on your church staff and key leaders as well. Here's a fun fact you probably didn't know. Mm. Tom Rainer's been my boss not once, but twice. Two different organizations. Tom Rainer was my boss. We've worked together. Um, I am largely in the area of research uh, because I was doing some stuff at a, at a mission agency. And then Tom hired me at Lifeway Research. And so that's the space we ended up in. Mm. So very thankful for Tom's invitation to those things. And so we can't have a conversation with Tom Rayner because we're going to talk some about particularly his, his latest book is I Am a Christian Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus Together with Fellow Believers, which in the time of divided churches is key. Mm. But we can't talk with Tom Rayner and I talk about some trends first. And so, Tom, talk to us a little bit about kind of what you're seeing in the church in this cultural moment, how is the cultural moment impacting what you're seeing in the church? Ed, when we begin to talk about what is happening, there are two major moments that we, and they're, they're not definitive moments, but they are moments that we need to look at. One is just the quarantine itself. I don't often refer to it as the pandemic because the quarantine was when churches were closed. And depending upon where you were, uh, depends on how long it was closed, when it was closed. The second thing is uh, this really ambiguous phrase called cultural Christianity. And those are the two paradigmatic issues that are taking place right now. When you're talking about COVID or the quarantine church, there are some stats that are pretty easy to discern. They're more correlated than they are causative. Well, if they are correlated, they can't be causative as a statistician statement, if you've ever heard one. They're more correlated in that larger churches have lower attendance relative to the pandemic than smaller churches. We can begin to guess some of the reasons why, but of the larger churches that we're looking at, we're defining that as above 500 in attendance, not extra large churches. The average decline, the median decline is about 25%. Mm. Then when you start looking below 500, the median decline is in the 17 to 18% range. That's statistically significant. We can begin to ask the question why, but I don't necessarily have the answers because you well know as a researcher, Ed, that we are just looking at the correlation, the larger you are, the more likely attendance is to be lower. So that's one of those things that we're, we're looking at. The other thing is cultural Christianity. You have lived, Ed, you've lived in a lot of places. You know that? I mean, <laughs> I have. From, from New York. Two of those places because of you. Two of those places because of you, but anyway. <laughs> well, and boy, did you make some major positive contributions uh, at those two places. So we, when we begin to look at cultural Christianity, you know well that when, depending on where you were, New York State, cultural Christianity was probably faded away by then. But then, then you go to Atlanta and you see that there's strong cultural Christianity back then. And what I mean by cultural Christianity, it's defined in different ways, but what I mean by cultural Christianity is people who attend church for the cultural benefit. It could be a business person who wants to get more business. It could be a politician who wants more votes. It could be a person living at home because they want to be accepted by others in the neighborhood. So the way we define cultural Christian is the primary motive for going to church is cultural benefit. Most of the cultural Christians probably are not Christians, so it's an oxymoron, but here's what has happened. Cultural Christianity was waning before the pandemic it is almost gone today. And that is true whether you're looking at Spokane or Nashville. Cultural Christianity has go away. So a large swath of people that many churches 
had attending their churches are now disappearing. So those are the two paradigmatic moments that we're seeing right now, the disappearance of cultural Christianity and the decline post COVID, they're obviously not mutually exclusive. Yeah, and it's so important, the, the cultural Christianity thing is that, and you know, we, we haven't talked about this. This is actually the first time Tom and I have had like a chat about some of these things. I listened to some of the resources he puts out, read the pot winners on podcasts, things of that sort. Um, but the way we've been describing it is, is that those who were loosely connected to the church, maybe showed up Christmas, Easter, three, five, seven times otherwise, have perhaps, uh, perhaps permanently, but significantly disconnected from the life of the church. And for us, you know, you and I are both deeply concerned about evangelism. That's a huge moment of an evangelistic shift because, I mean, you just said a minute ago that most cultural Christians aren't Christians. But what we also know is the re reality is most of the people who become Christians in our church called themselves Christians before they came to our church. But yes. part of what we do is we hopefully help them understand clearly what it means to be a Christian received by grace and through faith. So, but that pool of nominal Christians who were the space where much evangelism took place just may have just suddenly lurched. Again, it was 1% per year in some ways, but now it's lurched in the pandemic. What are some of the implications you think for evangelism in that time? I think there are deep implications for church and that's where we're gonna spend most of our time, but I know you love evangelism. So what are some implications for evangelism with the loss of that pool of nominal Christians? Well, it's not only implications, it's explicit. Churches as a whole have abandoned evangelism. Now, that's a broad, indicting statement, but it is a reality. Churches on a whole have abandoned evangelism. Let's look, let's look at the purposes of the church. Uh, let's go back to Warren's purposes. Uh, uh, fellowship, ministry, worship, discipleship, and uh, fellowship. Those, those are the five. Let's add prayers to six purpose. Okay, so we have six purposes. If you look at the rhythms of a church, a local church, what are they doing? What are they doing every week? Well, they're usually doing something in worship, discipleship, ministry, fellowship. They are usually doing something in prayer, but they're not doing anything in evangelism. Okay, here, here, here is our, uh, again, this is qualitative information, not quantitative, because we just, we've only gone deep on, on about 150 churches, so it's qualitative. Of those roughly 150 churches, only 1% is fewer than 1%. So that would be one or two churches of that pool. Only fewer than 1% have any type of ongoing evangelistic ministry, broadly defined, any way you want to define it. And we are looking for something that's taking place at least once a quarter. So the first thing that we know, Ed, is churches are not doing evangelism, to use that word loosely, doing. So now we have the implication that the cultural Christians are not showing up, so they're not hearing the gospel in the sermons. They're not hearing about Jesus in small groups. And so we have churches with lack of intentionality about evangelism. Again, if our qualitative research holds up quantitatively, it is going to be a massive blow to the churches because they're not reaching the people that they weren't were able to reach. And so bringing evangelism back into the regular rhythms of the local church is important. No, 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 it's not important. It is critical not only to be obedient to the Great Commission, but for the survival of churches. And that's what we see, to use a double negative, not taking place. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, I've seen over the last couple of years, uh, two types of people disconnecting from the church. Uh, one is the the nominal Christians you've talked about, Tom, and then uh, the other are, are those who are, you know, quote unquote, deconstructing their faith or church or, or something like that. And uh, as pastors and church leaders, we can often downplay the importance of being the local body for these people at this time. Uh, why is it important right now that, you know, in a sense, we should double down on the importance of the local church and why it matters, especially in the way that it pertains to Christians that are disconnecting from the church? Well, you bring up at least two great points. The first point is the importance of the local church. And I would say, that response, first of all, is biblical. If you look in the Bible and you start just kind of trying to find out where God has led his writers to write each of the New Testament books, and you start in Acts 2 and you go to Revelation 3, every single chapter written between Acts 2 and Revelation 3 is either to a local church or in the written in the context of the local church. The local church is God's primary plan A for his mission, and we don't see a plan B. So the first thing that we see is 
okay, God has emphasized the local church. Paul, when he wrote letters, did not write to some unknown group for the most part. He wrote to specific churches or individuals in churches. So the Bible talks about the importance of the local church. And yes, for those deconstructing their faith, second point, for those who, who are wondering, is, is there value in what I am doing? It is more important than ever than to connect these people to a local body. And here's the thing about it. Matthew 9 never told us that there was not hope to reach people. Jesus said to his disciples, pray for laborers in the harvest, for the harvest is plenty. So we know biblically that those, even those who feel alienated, even those who are wondering if their faith uh, has, has any foundation to it, we know biblically that they are ready to connect and they are there. The problem is not the people to be reached. The problem is the people who are not reaching them. And so that that possibility excites me to no end. And at my elderly state, however many years God gives me, I, 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 I want to give my life in ministry, however he will use me, to bringing the local church back to the Great Commission that it seems to abandon in large, in large swaths these days. Fascinating. And I, I think that, you know, part of what I think we have to look back on, I mean, COVID, you know, COVID, the, the shutdown was just substantively impactful. And what was interesting to me is, as you mentioned, um, you know, the, the numbers, larger churches versus smaller churches, also regions are affected differently. You know, I was interim at a church in New York City, uh, Calvary on, in Manhattan, across from Carnegie Hall, and a very different experience of COVID than even the suburbs of Chicago, where my home church is, or when I went down to Florida. Um, and and so, so the regions impact that. But one thing that I think uh, maybe, maybe I'll even make a little controversy here. Uh, I think that it was the way many pastors communicated has become problematic. So let me explain. So uh, some pastors communicated that this, we're going to, we're going to shut down. I recognize even talking about shutting down. I think it was 96% Lifeway Research, something we were both involved with in the past. Uh, Lifeway Research said, I think 96% of churches shut down either in the first two weeks that the president shut down the country or the month after. So it was pretty much everybody except small rural churches. But I think the way that pastors communicated taught people what they should think about when they'd regather. So I'm not actually making a statement about whether or not they should or shouldn't have shut down. I actually, I, I'm on record have writing that in places of high spread, that was the right thing to do, to adopt a temporarily deficient ecclesiology in the emergency for the sake of the mission. I got a big yellow slide that I'm thinking of right now. But that is really notes, impressive. That's impressive, Ed. Yeah, it's really good. I, 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 I got to go back and listen to this podcast and hear that that again. Oh, man. <laughs> but you here's may, the problem. You may hear that from me. No, that's, yeah, I like it. But here's the problem. I think that people that I love, and I actually, sometimes when I'm doing this as a seminar that's not being recorded, I mention a pastor that you and I are both friends with, who I think is wonderful. But what he said at the beginning was, the church is not closing. The church never closed. This is I almost, he almost said, this is just as good online. And I think that in hindsight, the better way to communicate it and the way, the way I mean, we, we talked about that in our church and our leadership is we communicated, this is a temporarily deficient ecclesiology in the emergency for the sake of the mission. And you need to know that something essential to what church is, is missing. And, but what we did is we taught people and they believed us that this was not a big deal. Being absent from church community, though, again, as one who said there were times to pause, um, is a big deal. And I think that's why I'm encouraged by, again, even your writing the book is I'm a Christian, uh, discovering what it means to follow Jesus together with fellow believers. But, but how do we make ecclesiology important again in a time when maybe, we, maybe some pastors oversold that shutdown is not going to be that disruptive to the life of the local church? Well, I, I've got to remember that phrase, temporarily deficient ecclesiology. Is it something like that? Temporarily deficient ecclesiology in the emergency for the sake of the mission. But uh, temporary is the key, and it was a deficient ecclesiology. So, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me give you a more colloquial phrase that has yeah. been taking place post-pandemic, post-quarantine more than ever. And it is this, the church is not a building, it's the people. There's an implication behind that. It is 
biblically correct, okay? The church is not a building, it's the people. But there's an implication, and usually there's a statement behind the statement. And usually the statement behind the statement is, it doesn't matter where we are, we're still the church. It does not matter if we gather. It does not matter if we're in community because we are still the church. And they use that statement to get comfortable with the type of statements that our friend pastors, and you know, he said, we have a mutual friend pastor who said this, I've narrowed it down to 15. So I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm not certain <laughs> which, which of the 15. This, this same type of com conversation was taken on by pastors. Many of them who were saying the digital church is the future and as if the gathered church was not a part of the future. And it's hard to regain some of that uh, credibility of the gathered church and people coming into community. And just one more side to all of this, sure, we had we had a lot of our groups that were on Zoom and other types of community video communication means in groups, but we still have good data that shows that when you have a sticky factor within a group, you have a sticky factor in discipleship. That's another question or another issue we could we could chase. So you're right. It was a temporarily deficient ecclesiology. It was something that has not been communicated the other way at this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Tom, let me let me flip that around a bit because I, I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, but there's also a sense in which in the pandemic, pastors and church leaders learned that what they had pre-pandemic was sometimes transactional environments totally. that they created. Yeah. So what are you seeing, some of the lessons learned coming out of the pandemic that pastors and church leaders are making sure that their gatherings, whether that's on a Sunday or in a small group on a Wednesday, that those are more meaningful gatherings and not transactional? Well, I think, I think first of all, I'm not sure that I know all that they're doing because I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that, uh, that we've gotten away from transactional Christianity. Mm -hmm. I will say, I will say this though, the, the churches that are doing well, and you can define well in different ways, not always numerical, but the churches that are doing well are stressing the importance of relational community, the importance of bring, coming back together, not just for transactional sake, but also to be part of the body that is operating together. Those are the type of churches that we're seeing that are doing well. I'm just not convinced right now that a lot of the North American churches, particularly, that a lot of the North American churches have moved away from transactional Christianity because that's what they knew before, and it's hard to change in the after, using the quarantine as a marking point. So the State of Theology report just came out, and we we did this, we, we started this with Ligonier when we were both at Lifeway, and we're going to Lifeway Research. And so it's gone on every, I think it's almost, I think I skipped one two-year cycle, but every two years. And lots of fascinating things. People should go to the stateoftheology.com. I just did an interview with uh, our, our friend Eric Geiger. We all used to work together. So our friend Eric Geiger about this. Um, but but in one of the more fascinating realities is, is that there is a shift, and I, I didn't see in the report whether it was a statistically significant shift, but it's obviously a noticeable shift in the percentage of people who say, basically, I can follow Jesus on my own. Like it's it tracks from 2016, you know, I'm paraphrasing the question, 2016, 2018, 20, and then 2020, and then 2022, it just, boom, yeah, I can follow Jesus on my own outside of the local church. So clearly the intervening experience of the pandemic, of the of lockdown and all that sort of stuff is, is has led to a theological shift. Now, I don't want news experiences, even big ones that are the greatest global crisis of your lifetime, to shift the theology. Right after my yellow slide on temporary deficient ecclesiology, my next slide says we need to elevate our ecclesiology and engage the mission, because I always alliterate. Elevate our ecclesiology and engage the mission. Part of elevating our ecclesiology, for those who are unfamiliar with the term, it's the idea of the theology of church. Again, part of it is in the subtitle of your book, discovering what it means to follow Jesus together with fellow believers. So how should a pastor or church leader right now, who may, maybe maybe this, you know, maybe they're they're uh, teaching or preaching, uh, maybe uh, they're 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 trying to call people back into relationships with feet and faces, not just electrons and avatars. How should they help so elevate good. the thinking? 
I forgot about your great alliteration, but I just can't <laughs> do them. I can't tell, I, I can't take the Southern accent and alliterate anyway, like the New Yorker. <laughs> I'm sorry. What was your question? Ed? So, so how do, how do pastors and church leaders help people who may have disconnected to some degree from the local church? How do we help them elevate their ecclesiology so they actually are seeing the value? You know, God has chosen the church to make known his manifold wisdom, Ephesians 3.10. But how do we help them see that when, man, it's already a lot of them have already disconnected? What's a path for leaders? Well, let me give you an example that has been multiplied several times. You know this uh, pastor by the name of, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, Jess Rayner? I've heard of him. I heard him. That's uh, right. We also, like, we've been on church staffs together. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love Jess. You used to say that you were in a Rainer sandwich. You worked with me and Jess worked for you. And it was it's true. It's true. You know, that, that, that was a unique experience. You didn't use the word interesting because that's an oblique word that has all kind of meaning behind it. Uh, Jess Rainer is, is a classic example of what we see multiplied. So I'm going to use the story of the church at Spring Hill. The church at Spring Hill now in in-person attendance is greater than it was pre-pandemic. That is happening in a few churches, but not a lot of churches. What has Jess done? Jess has magnified the importance of being in church alongside people through groups. And so he has elevated in-person, we call them community groups. Uh, maybe that's what you called them. And so he, he did the same uh, from working for you. We call them community groups. He, one of his responsibilities as pastor, he, del he has staff now, so he delegates things to others, but he has kept the responsibility for groups because he has said this particular part of the church, this organizational part of the organism is key to communicate what it means to work alongside people or to be alongside other Christians. And the more that we have emphasized groups at the Church of Spring Hill, the more the church has grown in its gathering as well. I don't think that that is a, a only correlation. I do think that there's a causation there. So we look at other churches and we are saying the same thing. What are you doing in your groups? What are you doing to bring people into the smaller community of 5, 10, 15, or 20 so that they will connect with the larger community, which is typically the gathered worship service? Hmm. Tom, I like you to speak to, to two things. One is I like you to speak to, uh, you know, what is loner Christianity? Like, what are some of the symptoms, some of the dangers of it? And then um, assuming churches respond and there's a bit of a boomerang effect, the Lord moves and people return to church because certainly that's what we're praying for, uh, those who are disconnected. How does the church leader prepare for those who have left church for a season and now they're going to return, knowing that they're coming back with a loner Christian mentality? Well, the loner Christianity is definitely a reality. It reflects much of what Ed just said, too, that uh, I, can, I, can, I can be a Christian. I can be a part of the church, whether it's universal or local. I can be a part of the church on my own. I don't need the others. I, I am fine by myself. So that loan of Christianity is definitely a reality. The first step I would take as a pastor is don't heap guilt on them. Uh, don't, when they come back, don't make them feel badly because they were gone. And you say, would a pastor really do that? Yeah. Yeah. Pastor <laughs> yes. would, a pastor would really, would, would really do that. Sometimes it's through subtle digs and sometimes through, it's through unfortunate illustrations. But the first thing I would do is welcome them back and embrace them and don't talk about the past as much as the present and, and, and moving forward. The second thing I would do at the risk of redundancy is to move them to the smaller community. Right. And uh, again, Jess, as the illustration I use, not the sole person doing it, Jess, uh, he, he starts talking about community, smaller community, the first time he meets someone. Mm -hmm. And that becomes an emphasis for him that, you know, Ed, I, I don't know how you describe Jess. I think you've always said he's your favorite Rainer and it really wasn't that close <laughs> to the others. <laughs> but, but Jess <clears throat> is warm, but he's also methodical. Yeah. He just takes one step after another. And that has, that has, to me, from a human point of view, been the key to the resurgence of our church move them to those communities. Yeah. And I think we, we, Tom and I wrote a book together uh, years ago called Transformational Church. And we talked about 
how, I mean, this is the percentage of people in smaller groups of whatever, you know, community groups, whatever you call them, uh, is a, uh, you actually see the percentages and the health that flows from it. And it impacts so many other things. And that's been a key part of our research and learning for, for many, many years. Um, help me a little bit more though on the uh, moving, pe moving people from electronic participation to physical participation. Knowing that a person, there are certain persons with disabilities, there might be some medical reasons, th those reasons are real and we don't wanna uh, devalue those reasons. One of the things that uh, we've shifted to at the church where I serve, a High Point Church, I'm, the I'm a teaching pastor there, but we used to have this thing called High Point at Home, which was like, I don't know, it was awesome. It was like we had our own studio because this was during, during COVID shutdown. And we wanted to make it awesome for people. And we determined by the time that we were done that we made it so awesome for people that they weren't coming back to church. So we actually have made it. And I had a group of, I had a conversation group with a group of larger church pastors who, you know, you know the ability to do something like that is a large church thing. And they all agreed, oh, we're trying to make it less awesome not to come to church. And also too, for me, you know, when I was at Calvary, I would look at the camera and say, listen, I know for some of you, you're a little nervous. We're gathering safely here. We want to invite you to come back. No one gets left behind. Let's not miss the community. Let's move from, you know, into community together. So are there some things you've seen churches do to try to find that missing back third, as I've called it? Is there some things out there that you're suggesting I want to pass on to us? Well, let's, let's talk about the missing third in terms of those who might be in the digital service. They're, yeah. They're, they may right, not be. Right, so right. and all, all might not be there. That's a good point, yeah. So all for those who are there, regardless of the size of your church, I think you should have a digital pastor or a digital director. I think okay. you should have someone who acts as the shepherd for those people. And I've seen churches of 60 or 70 have these type of people. So it's a great way to let someone else do the ministry that you think you may have been trying to do yourself as a pastor. So you, you, you get someone to do that. The more that you can connect with those people digitally, particularly if they are local, and the more you can talk about what God is doing in person at the church and the likelihood of maybe you connecting with them in the community, again, if they are local, all of that are, will play toward bringing them back to the in-person gathered community. But there will be a number as you have indicated, Ed, who have physical reasons, emotional reasons, um, in a number of reasons why they are not ready to come into the physical church. And that's why I've, I've pleaded with many pastors, don't shut down your digital venue. It may not be, it, you may not have to make it better than your in-person venue, but don't shut it down because that is still a mission field that is out there. But if you have a singular person to get to know these people, and the, the simple way that some of the most effective churches have done this is say, we want to take prayer requests. People mm -hmm. talk to you about prayer needs. And mm -hmm. so if you can have a digital prayer card and say, send us your prayer requests and I will follow up, we're finding that many of them are beginning to connect with them. It's not a massive move because we're really not seeing the digital church uh, only people return to the gathered church, but it could be the beginning of something to that effect. You know, Tom, a lot of folks that are returning back to church are carrying a lot of with them church hurt. So they may not be returning to the church that they felt hurt at, but they're returning to a new church. And if you're the pastor receiving them, what are your, what's your advice, encouragement? Is there a triage system that you recommend? I mean, how do you help them Number one, um, uh, you know, feel safe. And two, how do you begin integrating them into the life of a new church? Well, incredible question, because that is a pre-quarantine, during quarantine, and post-quarantine reality. Mm -hmm. People have been hurt in churches all along. My guess is among the three of us, one, two, or three of us may have felt pain in churches. I mean, I raise my hand. Yep, sure, me too. I, I, I have been hurt in churches. So it is almost a universal phenomenon among church members. So, you know, we accept that reality. One of the, one of the things that you do through maybe overt communication or at least implied communication is let the people know that you're not a perfect church and there never, there is not a perfect church. So uh, I was at ordination service last night in Jess's church and the guy that gave the ordination sermon that's what he was telling Robbie. He said, Robbie, the church at Spring Hill is not a 
Robbie's the guy getting ordained, is not a perfect church and you're not a perfect pastor. You have got to learn to live with other, each other. So then once you get, once you embrace them, once you have told them that there's not a perfect church, the, where you appeal to them biblically is to their biblically altruistic motives. Many years ago, I wrote a little book called I Am a Church Member. The whole basis of I am a church member, that's not a plug. It's just I'm telling you, I wrote a book. I guess it's now a plug whether I want it to be or not. I am a church member was appealing to the biblically altruistic nature of Christians to get them to look beyond themselves to serving and doing for others. And in other words, 1 Corinthians 12, I am a church member. I am a part of the body of Christ. That means I will function in this way. That means I'm functioning for the greater good of the body than I am myself. The more you get your members to see church, local church and universal church, particularly local church, through proper ecclesiology of serving and being a part of the body of Christ, the more they will have positive experiences. It may not remove the pain of the past, but it can minimize the pain of the past for the glory of the present and the good for God. Yeah, so much more we could unpack there, but we're kind of running out of time. I mean, I want to encourage people to pick up I Am a Christian. Depending on where you're listening, it'll be pre-ordered or ordered it, but it's called I'm a Christian, discovering what it means to follow Jesus together with fellow believers. All right. So so part of the challenge in the midst of all this is is people are um unsure what it means to be with fellow believers. We we talked earlier, I used the phrase transactional Christianity. And you're calling for something different. You're calling for some sort of community where we hold one another accountable. You know, what does that mean? That makes some people nervous and more. So if we were to really live out some of the invitation in I'm a Christian together with fellow believers, what might that look like? Twofold question, what might that, that look like? And how can the pastors and church leaders who are listening cast a vision for that in their church? If you could deal both of those, that'd be super helpful. Well, accountability is going to be, I think, one of the burgeoning issues of the local church in the future. And then by the main future, I mean in the next several months, because lack of accountability has been a key issue on the negative side in many churches. So accountability is going to be one of the big issues. So the first part of this is, I would say, pastors and other leaders must demonstrate their own accountability. That is the first step, whether they are articulating it in the, the context of a sermon or in a new members class, they must show how they are accountable and how it is good for them to be accountable. I, I, I think all of us have experiences like this. The less we are accountable, the more we are likely to go down a path we should not. And the positive of that is the more that we are accountable, the more we should go down the path that we find joy in the local church. Then how do we do that? You know, what are the levels of accountability? And sometimes we think about church discipline in, in the sense of someone had some type of uh, moral failure and uh, we, we confront them. And if we if they don't turn their act around, then uh, we bring them before the church. But there's all kind of accountability that can take place other than that big scale type of church discipline. One is in groups. One is in the elders or the deacons. Another is in expectations that we communicate in a new members class. Uh, you mentioned I am a Christian, Ed. One of the things, one of the reasons I wrote I am a Christian is because I, I felt like there was a gap. There was, there, there was this gap that we talk about church membership, we talk about living as a Christian, and sometimes we separate the two. And so we have, here's how you grow as a Christian, here's how you become a part of the body of Christ. Well, if you become a part of the body of Christ in the true biblical way, that engenders accountability. And so you communicate in whatever your entry point class, it may not be called a new members class, but whatever you have as an entry point class, you communicate that reality so that everybody there knows that that's part of what you do. That's how you tell in the members, but then you embody it yourself as a leader and demonstrate that. You've been listening to Tom Rayner. We hope you, our conversation with him have been helpful to you. Uh, be sure to check out his latest book, I Am a Christian, Discovering What It Means to Follow Jesus Together with Fellow Believers. You can learn more about Tom at churchanswers.com. And again, thanks for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. 
that'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.